some old timers in here. <clears throat> no offense or anything here, Mark. But uh, we've got some people who have experience in RF. Uh, so the first part of this may be kind of dry, but I assure you, you'll all be challenged before we're done. Uh, another reason we're covering it from beginning to end is because, again, we want to get it on tape to, to send out to some of the guys who have no experience. <clears throat> I don't know. Kathy, can you get that, or do I need to lower that? Zoom in on it there if you can. Okay. Got a little bit light on it. Well, fiddlesticks. Go ahead and pause it. Let me move it down. The very, very basics. We're going to go from the beginning, and the goal is to get into the great depth in how to baseline a multiple carrier site, SCPC site. We'll also get into a lot of depth on proper use of a spectrum analyzer, which seems to be something that everybody wants to know. Uh, again, not so much for you people, but those of looking at the tape for the first time, you know, the satellites in what we call a geometric orbit, <coughs> geocentric. Uh, we're uplinking on C-band, 6 gigahertz, and we downlink on 4 gigahertz. And I think you've all got a copy of that, too. Uh, KU band is uplinking on 14 gigahertz, and the satellite translates that down 12 gigahertz. Uh, most of you, maybe not all of you, are familiar with translation. In other words, if we uplink at 6, then the satellite translates that 22, 25 megahertz and brings it back down. So in other words, if you know your transmit frequency and you don't know your receive frequency, you can determine your receive frequency by subtracting 22, 25 megahertz. On KU band, though, you would subtract 2,300 megahertz. Or add if you have your receive frequency and you want to know your transmit. And there are, from time to time, you need to know that. So at least one guy's had to do that. He's shaking his head. <clears throat> so uh, that's basically it. Uh, the satellite is in a geometric, or is it geocentric? Which is it? That's what I thought. I don't know how I got geometric on there. So, excuse me. Uh, geocentric orbit uh, is traveling around the equator so that the satellite is moving at you know, just the right speed so that the antenna doesn't have to move to track it. There are different orbits, you know, spy satellites and all that are going over other countries, but they're only, they can only see that area of the, of the world at you know, diff different time lengths, two hours a day or 10 hours, depending on its orbit. But the geocentric orbit around the equator, you have communications 24 hours a day, and they're in sync with each other. That's basically all we need to talk about that. I don't imagine there's any questions on that, are there? Oh, I can't reach out, so what the heck. The satellite don't just stay still up there. I thought it stayed still. No, it's actually resolve, revolving <clears throat> around the, the Earth. Same speed the Earth is. Right. In relation to the Earth, it's staying in one place. Right. right. If this is the Earth, and this is where your antenna's at, and the satellite's out here, okay, it's 22,000 miles out in space, and you know it's going around like this. At the same time, the Earth is rotating, and they're in sync with one another. When, the, when this point's up here, then the satellite's going to be up here. See, it has to be going a lot faster than the Earth is rotating. Right. To keep up. Well, well, that's why it's at 3,000 miles out. So it's like swinging a ball out there. That ball, you may be going around. That ball is going so much faster than what you are. Right. So it's really, really cooking, isn't it? I don't know how fast it goes. I'm sure people do, but it doesn't. Same satellite have KU band and C band on the same satellite? Yes, the newer ones do. The old styles didn't much, but uh, you know our newer ones, ASC one and also ASC two, which is now called SpaceNet four, I believe. Uh, isn't that right, Mark? Uh, SpaceNet four and ASC one are uh, have. As a matter of fact, we're going to get into that. They have uh, KU and C band. 
three slots, four or five slots for satellites. You know, they were, they were figuring that they were going to be put up. They were slotted for those. Did they still have that? I don't know. I really don't know. My, you got me on that. Anybody else know that? Okay. Where is this sheet here? Did y'all, I don't know if you have these. <coughs> I know you probably don't have this other one I'm giving you at SpaceNet 4. <clears throat> also, too, for your information, toward the end of this class, we'll have, uh, you know, we'll talk about troubleshooting. And we'll go into the equipment and system flow, et cetera, and then we'll actually spend the whole day where I put a bug in the system and then you all get to find it. That's the fun part. That way I get to sit back and watch you guys. <laughs> Trouble on the other end. Well, we've got a translator here, so we're going to simulate the other end. So one of you be on one end, one of you be on the other. Or actually, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Anyhow, this... Uh, How many of you uh, have seen these? I doubt that any of you have seen SpaceNet 4's frequency plan. Any of you, are you familiar with these at all? Mark shaking his head. Steve, okay. <clears throat> uh, this is for ASC1. And let's see, let me. Let's talk about this one, ASC-1. These are your transponders, okay? The, these narrow ones here are 40 megahertz wide, and these bigger ones are 80 megahertz wide. Your newer satellites have 80 megahertz transponders on them now, whereas the old Westar system, I think they only had the 40 meg. <clears throat> now, polarization. Who wants to explain to me what we mean by polarization on a satellite? So I don't have to do all this. This is a two-way conversation here. It's basically 90 degrees out of phase from each other. Right. Why do we do that? Cross. Right. But why? More space availability for the right. transponders. In other words, uh, how wide is the satellite? Can anybody tell me? What's the frequency bandwidth of the satellite? Five hundred megahertz. Now that's what it is on the old Westar system. On the ASC one and ASC two, we'd have to figure that out, but I think it's the same. If it's not, don't don't kill me. But you know, the old West Star was this way. That's what I was brought up on. <clears throat> um, you know, we can actually add this, and that'll tell us. 500 megahertz. So all the satellites, or at least all the ones that that we're using, ASC1 and SpaceNet4, and all the West Stars for that matter, they have the same frequency. They have 500 megahertz. And can anybody tell me what that is? Uh, I anybody? 39, what the heck is it? No, 37. Been, been a while since I, I haven't taught a class to you since I was down there teaching with you. 37. Uh, 37. 42. 42. Okay. 
3.7 gig to 4.2 gig, if I'm not mistaken. And that's what, 500 megahertz, right? I guess I want to put gigahertz. I guess, uh, you know, we should get basic here for a second. What is a gigahertz? You know, for the people on the tape, if nothing else. You know, we just mentioned 500 megahertz. What's, what's 3.7 gigahertz? A, uh, yeah, that's a good answer. A gigahertz is a thousand million. A gigahertz, one gigahertz is a thousand million. <clears throat> In other words, if we had a million, that's a million. A gigahertz, this is a million, and I should have messed up. Oh, shoot, that's not right. I was right the first time. If you had 900 or 9999999 megahertz, and then the next one would be a gigahertz, right? Right. See, if this is the, the millions place, you got a thousand megahertz. In other words, if I give, <laughs> give you just said, if you had 999 million, then one more million would give you a gigahertz or a thousand million. <clears throat> so, um, back to where we were, we're 500 megahertz wide and like I say, you know, these tr satellites are transmitting on the same the same band pass, 3.7 to 4.2. So we only have a limited amount of of uh, frequency space there we can use. So somebody had this great idea that we could use the same frequencies again. Well, first of all, let's say you're transmitting a carrier at 3.7 uh, gig and you've got somebody else transmitting on that carrier. So you got two people transmitting on the same frequency. Is that going to work? No way. Sometimes you go in and you have uh, the circuit's down because somebody else is, on, is underneath you. A real quick way to tell that too, if your carrier is 3 dB hotter than it usually is, you got two carriers up in the same spot, it'll be higher. <clears throat> so anyhow, you know, somebody had this great idea of cross-polarization so that you change your feed by 90 degrees, as Mark said, and, uh, you know, the little, the little pickup in there, you know, one, You got a little pickup in there. Now, if you rotate that thing, you rotate that OMT assembly 90 degrees out, now you can pick up all those frequencies and they don't interfere. In other words, you could transmit at 37 or 3.7 gig here and 3.7 gig here, and they're totally isolated from each other. Not totally. <laughs> what would we, what, what kind of isolation would we expect to see? Uh, let me rephrase that. If we got 3.7 gigahertz here, and then we rotate to, you know, we got a carrier there. If you look in your spectrum analyzer, you got a carrier there. Now, if we rotate that feed, what would you expect that carrier to do? If we rotate that feed 90 degrees and peak it on the opposite pole, are you, are you still going to see that carrier at all? Everybody agree with that? We got a no over here. You have to still see it. You would think it can't watch that. Okay. Carriers are still going to be there. Mark's right, in, Mike's, Mark's right in that you shouldn't see it. But. Uh, it's almost like a side load. To a frequency. What we're getting at here is, is you're looking for 30 dB of isolation. That's typically what we shoot for, is around 30 dB or better. We can get by with a little less than that, but we don't really like it. For instance, if you had, uh, 
let's emphasize the point here. Let's say that you've got a uh, 20 dB C over N carrier, you know, coming down at you. And uh, let me re <clears throat> if your isolation is really, really poor and you flip that dude over, then, you know, say there's a carrier on the other side and you only had, let's say you only had 15 dB of isolation. Would you, and you turned it over, would you see any of that carrier on the other side? How much? 5 dB. Right. You see 5 dB. <laughs> Where you, you typically don't, typically don't see this a whole lot with modulated carriers because, you know, if you've got 20 dB of isolation or more, you're not going to see it. And the way you normally test that is you put up a CW and you know you shoot for a, a 30 C over N plus. It's kind of nice to have around 35, 36 dB C over N. And then you have somebody look at the opposite pole and they gnaw you out. They try and, because if, if let's say you've got a 36 C over N, okay, and uh, your isolation, and we'll say, is 30, then how much of that carrier would you see on the other side, somebody besides Mark? Right. <clears throat> so if they see you at 36 here, and they see you at 6 on the other side, then basically you've got a 30 dB of isolation, which is what we're shooting for. Now it's a little more sophisticated than that. You know, NOCC normally does that, and it's definitely more sophisticated than that, but that's a good rough idea of what they're doing. They actually see two CWs and they got to figure out which one to look at, but that's, since we're never looking at that, we're not going to bother with it. <clears throat> so, without, you know, by rotating this 90 degrees, we can actually use this whole 500 megahertz spectrum again and they won't interfere with each other providing you have your polarization peaked. And the flip side of your polarization being peaked means that the other side is nulled. That's really what we're after. We want the other side nulled. You know what I mean by null? You know, the lowest amount of signal on the, on the other pole. That's going to be real important in the upcoming months, too, when we start transitioning everything over to the new bird. Are they set when that's going to come about? Or are they still in the planning? Or since, it's going to be like this is on, day, it's going to go boom. Here since this is on tape, I don't know if I should say they'll probably wait until ASC1 dies, but uh, we can thing, edit that out. The only thing we're going to be involved there will be <coughs> if you know, CC is still there. What's that? It, the only way we're going to be involved in that is if you know CC is still there, or we use SpaceNet, is we're going to have them on the phone and move it, and they're going to tell you where it's right or wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. You have no way of looking at your crossbow. Uh, yes and no. We've <clears throat> we've got a procedure together, uh, which we've just sent out to you, and actually we're going to be sending a video tape that, that explains that procedure. And we're going to be putting up a carrier on both poles so you can actually look at the other one yourself and gnaw yourself. Okay. So that when you do come up and uh, NOC or who's the control now? Uh, McLean, Virginia, I guess, mm -hmm. GTE. You know, when we come up, we're going to be real close to being on the money. <clears throat> okay. So like I say, these little ones are 40 megahertz and the big ones are 80. And as you can see, uh, they talk about vertical and horizontal polarization here. It's pretty much self-explanatory now that we've explained what polarization is. The, uh, the, again, this is uh, C band and this is KU band for ASC1. Now, this is showing ASC1 and SpaceNet 4. And you're going to say, well, they're the same. For instance, you see transponder 13, the center frequency is 3980, and it's the same on this one. 
what is the key difference here? Any that jump out at anybody real quick? What's the key difference between these birds that's going to be very important for us to realize <clears throat> when we transition? I guess. Uh, the beacon frequencies, yes, are a little different. That's very good. Um, may not affect us too much because hopefully we're going to have a CW carrier up there with about a 36 C over N coming out of a couple of our sites <clears throat> for you to try and lock on because the beacon typically is a far less than 30 dB. Uh, I don't recall what they are. Do you, Mark, what a beacon C over N is? It's usually around 30 because they like to keep it up there where you can see it. It doesn't fluctuate. Is it really? <coughs> I have, well, I have, well, I'm going by, they used to have one that was almost 30 on uh, West Star 3. West Star, yeah. I think you find ASC 1, uh, the beacons are considerably less than that. But um, uh, again, go with what you were saying, if you could get a CW up there, 30 dB, that somebody has control over it. Right. If we can get a 36 up there, for instance, if, if the beacon's only, say, 25 C over N, and we can get somebody to put up a CW with 35 C over N, then why are we far better to look at the 35? If we're, you know, <clears throat> if we're going to be looking for this satellite, you know, this satellite's 23,000 miles out in space, and we're trying to find it, right? So what is the advantage for somebody to already be on that bird putting out a 35 C over N carrier versus 25 on the beacon. It's a lot easier to find. It's a lot easier to find. Why is that? It's not a normal signal. It's not a normal signal compared to the other satellites. Right. Uh, okay, so I agree with you. It's not nominal. It is higher. It's going to be easier to find, but why is it easier to find? Right. I guess what I'm after here is that <clears throat> as you start sweeping we're getting sidetracked a little bit, but as you start, you know, your spec and as you're moving your antenna toward the center lobe, you know, you're going to, as you're swinging through, you know, you're going to see this one first, and then this one, and then that one, and then it'll drop down to this one and this one. You know, that's why it's important always to, to swing completely through where you think it really is supposed to be and make sure that, that you have a drop here. You might tell me what's typical for this drop between the main lobe and the side lobe? About 15 dB. 